Good morning. Caught you by surprise. Happy Sunday. All right. It is a beautiful day. More rain that came our way. And uh, great to be worshiping in one accord and truth and in knowledge. Stand to join us all for uh, one of our classic, wonderful hymns of the faith. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term Baptist hop. How many of you know that term? Well, growing up, this was Southern Baptist, but there was the four or five verses in the song. We usually skip the third. A reason I never knew why. I, I guess time constraints. But, uh, takes, what, an extra 30 or 45 seconds to do that extra verse, but I grew up doing the Baptist talk in the little church I grew up in in eastern New Mexico, and sometimes those third verses were pretty good verses, and sometimes the song is the method. One, two, three, four the verses all flow, and they tell the story. So early on, I decided I was never going to do the Baptist talk, and we sing all the verses of the song. I think there's a reason they were there in the first so this is one that actually has five verses. We're going to do all five. But it's a good one to do all five verses. No, not one. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not No, No, 
And say amen with me. Amen. That's beautiful. You know, uh, so I guess, Randy, you are anti-Baptist hop, but you are pro-Baptist dancing. Because you, you do a lot of country western leaning, so that's good. Well, we love you, brother. We are glad you're here today. Welcome to our church family, and thanks for being a part. Uh, if you are new to this uh, group of people, welcome for the first time. We're glad you're here. There's a little connection card in your uh, worship bulletin. We'd ask you to fill that out and uh, place it in one of the foyer offering plates at the end of the service so we can welcome you personally. Make sure you know we're glad that you're here. We want everybody to have a chance to uh, be greeted today, even if you were uh, fashionably Santa Fe and late. So if you would, find somebody that doesn't look familiar to you and welcome them to church today. Maybe somebody older or younger than you you are. All right, if you'd find your seats, you may be seated. Hear God's word with me as we continue to worship from Psalm chapter 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass with sprouts anew. Let's pray as we continue to worship. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Every generation in our church are your kids. You are our Father. And we come to you and want to bring you our best worship. We have all kinds of things going on in our lives today, Lord, and we lay them at your feet right now. And we want to focus our minds and our hearts on the God who came to this earth and gave his life to save us. It's in your name we pray and worship. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing? All righty. Okay, this is a new song for our church at least. So feel free to sing along and clap your hands. That's, you got to do that. Watch, check it out. i 
All right, this is a softer one, so don't clap. Good morning, First Family. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, guests, we're so glad that you could be here today. What a beautiful day it is here in Santa Fe. Uh, joining the youth theme this morning, I have my big brother, <clears throat> I mean my little brother, joining me this morning, Noah Ritas. And uh, I'm standing up here because five years ago I used to look down at him, but today he is my little big brother. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for all that you have done. We do not deserve your love, but yet you give us your love and more. Lord, thank you for all the generous people that have give, given to this church that allow us to have a staff and that my dad can work here. And I pray that you can bless this offering. And all God's people said, amen. All right, and then this song, a lot of you might not know it, but it came out like when I was six, and I really liked it, so you'll catch on. It's really catchy.
Please turn with me to Luke 2.46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astound, astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? This microphone on and moved up. Don't you like it when you hear a, a brand new song to you? And the leader says it came out when he was six years old. Just kidding. That was Michael Romero leading our youth band. Did a wonderful job. Students, uh, great job. We have uh, youth doing slides in the back, a greeting at the doors this morning, helping bring the donuts today, uh, helping in the nursery, and of course, uh, leading our music. We're so proud of you guys. We love you. And Excited to see you grow in the Lord and transform more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We love you guys. Good job. Let's pray together, church. Father, may the words of my mouth today and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you weren't with us, last week we looked at Luke's commitment to truth, exact truth, from the first few verses of Luke chapter 1, beginning a new series um, called Pursuing the Truth uh, from the book of Luke, looking at Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to skip all the way from Luke 1.5 all the way to chapter 2.39, if you want to turn there, and that's so that I can preach through the rest of Luke one and two at Christmas time. And I can already tell, I forgot to announce, kiddos, you can head back to uh, kids worship if you'd like, uh, just down the hallway. Uh, we'll have uh, people down there ready to greet you and lead you through kids worship time. So we're going to save the rest of Luke one and two for Christmas time. Today we're going to move to Luke 239, but I do want you to know the context. Let's think about it before we read this more closely. Luke fills chapters one and two to show us how Old Testament prophecies, some of which were thousands of years old at the time of the birth of Christ, he fills chapters 1 and 2 to show that those prophecies have now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Messiah has come. He has arrived. We see him in those chapters as a newborn baby. We're talking about prophecies that fulfilled signs in the natural world, stars, shined differently because Christ had come. Signs and angels appearing to shepherds and announcing great news. Wise men come from the east. God speaking to Elizabeth and to Mary. At the same time, prophets in the temple like Simeon and Anna who didn't know any of that other stuff, but they saw him and recognized this is the Messiah. Even baby John the Baptist recognizes Messiah Jesus while they both are in the womb. Pretty amazing. Into that context, we pick up the story here in Luke 2, 39. Read along with me. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to, the, to their own city of Nazareth. This is uh, at the end of uh, Jesus being in the temple and Anna recognizing who he was. Verse 40, the child continued to grow and become strong. Increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. 241. Now his parents were to, uh, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. So it's springtime in Jerusalem. It's the season of Passover. This is 20 years after this event that we're reading about, that Lene did a great job of reading the scripture about. Jesus will again be in Jerusalem 20 years from what we're reading. And at that time, he'll be eating the Passover meal for the last time with his disciples the night before he goes to the cross. 
in the upper room. But that's 20 years in the future from this moment. We're at Jesus is just 12. As I was working on this sermon, I realized that I would be preaching today about Jesus at age 12, the day after my daughter turned 12. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So happy birthday yesterday, Emery. She's on the slides uh, for us today. That's been her uh, service. Good job back there. So for reference, my daughter is the same age as Jesus in this study that we're st- Yeah, you can give her a clap. I like that. This is one of the only stories we have between all of that text that we have when Jesus is a baby, his birth details, and the beginning of his public ministry when he gets baptized as an adult by John the Baptist and then tempted in the desert, all of that beginning at age 30. So this is a really important story if we want to know our Lord Jesus well. So study carefully with me the details that Luke gives us. Luke shows us that our Messiah, you can look on your sermon notes, at age 12 had godly parents. Luke works hard to communicate that Mary and Joseph lived as righteously as they could. Look at there in verse 39. When they had performed everything according to the law of their Lord. They were trying to do everything according to the law. They, they were careful about it. Look at verse 41. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. He's trying to tell us these parents want to follow God's law, even the godly customs of their day. They wanted to be godly parents. But, look at verse 43. As they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem But his parents were unaware of it. So as they're going back to Nazareth out of Jerusalem, they get a full day's journey down the road. And someone says, where's Jesus? I sort of picture this like Macaulay Culkin's mom on the airplane when she realizes that she left him at home. Kevin! Um, (laughs) Where in the world is Jesus? Mary says, Joe, I thought you had him. Joe says, sweetie, when do I ever have the kids? And Mary says, exactly, when do you ever have the kids? These parents had left the Son of God. And not just a little bit left. He gets all the way left. They are a day away. In fact, the main route that they would have traveled from Jerusalem, moving north toward Nazareth, descended about 3,000 feet over that day's Walk. So Santa Fe ski area, the parking lot up here is at 10,000 feet. Santa Fe is at about 7,000 feet. So they dropped that distance over a day's journey north coming out of Jerusalem. It's a rugged, rocky, stony, downhill climb. And there were robbers on this journey. That's part of probably why they traveled in a caravan. They have aunts and uncles. Everybody is there together traveling. In verse 44, they start looking for Jesus among this caravan, all these relatives and friends. This was the first Amber Alert. I'm thankful there are Amber Alerts on our phone. I think it's helpful. I mean, it's a good thing to help find these children that are being abused. But before there was an Amber Alert, you had to just go yell for Amber, right? Every time our cell phone goes off with an Amber Alert, I want you to remember that before there was Amber, there was Jesus. And he got left. They sent out uh, this Jesus alert in the caravan of people who had traveled together. If there were any gossipers in the caravan, and there probably were, you know they were having a field day with this one. Mary thinks she's so special. Gets to birth the Son of God. Real blessed and highly favored now, aren't you among women, Miss Mary? In fact, John 7, 5 tells us that some of Jesus' relatives struggled to believe in him as, as the Messiah at first. You know, Joseph's buddies were letting him have it too. Joseph, you had one job. One job. You didn't have to make the Messiah, but all you had to do was not lose the Messiah. Verse 44 says they don't find him among all their relatives and acquaintances. Parents, think about how embarrassing that had to be. 
They don't find him. So now verse 45, they have to travel a day's journey back south. They have to ascend now that 3,000 feet up to Jerusalem. They get there and they still can't find him. It takes a full third day to find Jesus, verse 46 says. So my question for us this morning is, is why include this story and all of these details? I mean, it's sort of embarrassing for the family. I don't know about you, but some parents might not like their bad moves being written down for all of history in the best-selling book of all time. Why put this story here? I think there are three very strong emphases that Luke is giving us. And I want to go over them with you. So first, Luke is showing us that at age 12, our Messiah Jesus had godly parents who were not perfect. Godly parents who were not perfect. Why does Luke include this? Because this is exactly what parenting is like. Mary and Joseph are trying to be godly parents. Verse 39 and 41 make that clear. Do, I think, along those lines, their godliness, notice how important the faith community is to their parenting. They were humble enough parents to realize they want other godly people besides themselves in their children's lives. And then travel to Jerusalem on their own. They went with friends. They go to the temple every year, Luke is telling us. They want to raise their children in the faith community. The book of Hebrews says for Christians today, do not forsake assembling together. Do not forsake assembling together. And that's true as much for our children as it is for us. I want my kids to grow up around you guys. There are some godly people in this church who exhibit a witness to Jesus Christ and the fruit of the Spirit in ways that I don't. Maybe a lot better than I exhibit what it means to follow Christ. I want my kids around those people, you all. I want them to hear from people other than me what it means to be a godly person. There's this great picture going around social media. Maybe you've seen it if you're on uh, those those channels. If you're not, I'll describe it to you. It's a, a picture of a lion chasing this young little zebra. It's a little foal. It labels the pack of zebras as the church. And this foal is off all by itself, and the lion is just like one step away from gobbling up this little baby uh, zebra. And it says, under the little feeble zebra, I'm a Christian who thinks he doesn't need the church. I'm a Christian who thinks he doesn't need the church. And the the idea, what it's insinuating is that this little creature is about to get gobbled up because it moved away from the faith community. It moved away from people that were there to encourage him, to lift him up, to help him grow in the ways of Christ. And I, I would agree that I think scripturally that is one of Satan's strongest tools to isolate and then devour. And we've got to be so careful with that isolation. And it's been one of my great privileges over the last year to see you guys come back to church for the first time after lockdown. And I have seen person after person after person when they step over that threshold. And it's not the building, but the people. And their eyes fill with tears. And this big smile on their face. I am so ready to be back here. It's been a great privilege to see. Luke shows us Mary and Joseph prioritize the faith community. They are trying to be godly, but they still make a mistake and lose the Messiah. Therefore, be encouraged, parents. Be encouraged. You don't have to be perfect for God to love you. You don't have to be perfect to raise pretty amazing kids. Isn't that good news? We don't have to be perfect parents. The gospel is, in fact, that God only loves imperfect people. You can't be perfect. There is no perfect person in the Bible besides Jesus Christ. That's the message today. And listen carefully. Perfect people don't get into heaven. Did you know that? They don't. Because there are none. Imperfect people get into heaven who have laid their imperfections at the feet of the Messiah and asked Him 
for his salvation. Trusted in him to save. And then got back on the road of repentance and following him as Lord. Yes, trying to live a righteous life. You know, if you're not a a regular church person, listen closely. Perfect people don't get into heaven. You're in the right place today. You're listening to the right message if you're on one of our broadcasts. Perfect people would get into heaven if there were any. But there aren't besides Christ. It's a part of what Luke is telling us this morning. Ephesians 2 describes more what's going on there. Listen to Paul. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And he says later, You were by nature children of the wrath of God, even as the rest. The message of the Bible is that we are separated from God in our sin. But those who are willing to call on Christ as Savior and Lord will find themselves reunited in a relationship with God. It goes on in Ephesians 2, 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, His love is a symphony. Matthew, I love that song. It's just exactly right. Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. It says down in Ephesians 2, 7, and so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Imperfect people who have by faith trusted in Christ alone for their salvation, become transformed, made alive. When we trust in Christ and we mean it and we begin repenting and following Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus makes us our spirit alive. We get born again. Jesus teaches us in that moment by grace alone, God's goodness alone, through our faith alone. Does that transformation begin to happen that leads us eventually to heaven? Not through perfect works. And that's good news. Good news for parents, good news for kids. When I was eight or nine, my mom dropped me off at basketball practice. She drove off just like she had done a hundred times before. But that night, they had moved my basketball practice. It wasn't there. And in my mom's defense, now that Amy and I are parents... Uh, I would say trying to keep up with practice schedules is sort of like solving calculus in your head without paper. Eight-year-old Reed was the only person at this person's home out in the country. They had their own little basketball court. It was before cell phones. And I have to tell you, I remember being scared at eight or nine. They had all these big tall trees. It was nighttime, but they had these outdoor lights. And so those they cast shadows that moved on everything. And little eight-year-old Reed, man, he was flipping out about this whole situation. And finally, after an hour or so, their senior high school uh, girl, uh, daughter, comes home. She came driving up. She was a cheerleader. And of course, I was so embarrassed. Little eight-year-old kid, I go over to, can you help me? And it was completely dark in her house. And she was like, oh my goodness, what's happened here? And uh, she helped me. Mom came and got me. Everything was fine. And I used to remember pridefully, look, look on, looking back at that experience and thinking about that day, how on earth could my mom leave me? I mean, doesn't she care about me? And, and I really, honestly, as a, a growing up, is one of the things I had to work through. I really let Satan tell me that I was somehow less because she'd made a little mistake. And then, the day, the day that my church ordained me to the gospel ministry in Tiburon, California, Tiburon Baptist Church. This holy day of ordination, a great day of festival, not unlike this Passover festival where Mary and Joseph are. And I'm thinking about the day and it was so much fun and I'm kind of thinking I'm something special. I got ordained today. And after the ordination, we go out to eat and I had picked this nice restaurant. We had family in from out of state. We had a, a pastor in from out of state who had mentored me, preached the ordination sermon. And I uh, went to this, the oldest restaurant in San Francisco. It's a really cool place. Some of our church members worked there and I was focused on hosting this family and everyone finding parking in downtown San Francisco and getting inside and I get inside. And everybody turns and looks at me as I, I walk in the door and someone says, Reed, where's Noah? 
And I bet my face flushed all shades of red. I've got all these people in town that I'm thinking about hosting them. My mind wasn't even on, and slowly it begins to dawn on me. I left my eight-month-old baby in the car on a street in San Francisco. I was so embarrassed. I run out the door, run across the street. I mean, he's literally only 30 yards across the street, um, you know, parked there inside the car. He was still asleep when I got him out of the car in his car seat. But still, that, j- that day changed my perspective really fast on how could my mom leave me. Pride comes before a fall. Ordination day of a very ordinary, imperfect person. Godly parents losing God. Parents, we should all be encouraged. Luke is showing us in some ways how utterly human Jesus' parents were. His parents were great, but they weren't perfect. Just like moms and dads, you're not going to be perfect either. Moms and dads, we owe our children our best. Our best, though, will not be perfection. Children, listen, give your parents a break. The Bible teaches us, children, you should honor and respect and obey your parents while you're still a child and then honor them forever. But it takes a lot of work to keep you people alive. And your parents can be pretty amazing creatures and still make mistakes. Guess what, kids? No child can be perfect either. Christ was unique in that way. Parents, we need to help encourage them towards their best, but always with love and grace, remembering our expectations of them should not be perfection either. They're kids. Gary L. Thomas is past, one of the pastors at Second Baptist Houston, and he's also a great sell, best-selling author. He writes this in his book, Sacred Parenting, How Raising Children Shapes Our Souls. He says, have you ever noticed the severe discrepancy behind the very few verses in the Bible that discuss how to parenting and the hundreds of Christian books that confidently proclaim God's plan for parenting or something similar? Thomas goes on, the silence in the Bible on the plan for parenting, along with the repetition in the Bible on spiritual growth, should lead us to conclude that God believes, catch this, God believes the parent's own spiritual growth is the most essential part of how-to parenting. In other words, God may be telling us, grow in me every day. In faith, patience, virtue, love, and worship, the fruit of the Spirit, and let that faith and growth perfume your house and anoint your children, Thomas says. So true. So many people want the easy five steps to becoming a better parent. But God is saying, grow in me and you'll become the best parent you can be. The best grandparent you can be. Learn the gospel in your heart and your family will be blessed. Our children don't need perfect parents. They need grace-filled parents, gospel parents. Kids, adult children, if you're holding on to some resentment for some particular mistake that your parents made, Jesus commands you to forgive them. Did you know that? It's not a question, it's a command. I'm not saying bad parenting is okay, it's not. It's sinful, abuse is sinful, evil, and wrong. But the Bible wants you to learn that no parent is capable of being perfect except God the Father. It's an unrealistic expectation to expect your parents to be for you what only God can be for you. That leads us to point two. Luke includes this story first to speak to parents and second to show how unique Christ is. At only age 12, Jesus, our Messiah, was 100% God, divine. When you want a perfect person to love you, be it a parent or a spouse, listen, you can only find that in God. Remember that chapters 1 and 2 have people worshiping this baby as God, what we celebrate at Christmas, the miracle of this little baby being God himself, that God could put on flesh. I love how the song puts it in Hark the Herald, veiled 
in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. It means that inside of that baby, the flesh kind of masked it, but inside of that baby is 100% divine godliness. God himself has come in the flesh. So we get all this rich illusion in the Old Testament about the birth of Christ and that God had promised the Messiah thousands of years before that he would send this person a savior. But then we get this long, quiet time of of 30 years and we don't hear much about Jesus. And Luke wants us to know what happened in that 30 years in the meantime. Well, Jesus was just as much God as he ever was. Notice there's three basic ways that Luke is showing us the divine side of the Messiah in this passage. First, 12-year-old Jesus amazed professional theologians. These rabbis usually had to teach kids. And usually 12-year-olds are still wiping snot from their nose onto their t-shirt. I know I just have had some in my house. Uh, 12-year-olds still have to be reminded to take a shower to wash off, to put on deodorant, all of these things. They would rather go play than learn Hebrew. And you notice, here's Jesus helping to teach the rabbis. Notice verse 47. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. What does that mean in the Greek? What does all mean? It means all. Jesus had captivated the Jewish establishment at the center of the Jewish faith, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they all were amazed at the things he was saying. And second, we see, how do we know that Jesus is God? We see that not only the depth of his understanding, but his own self-understanding is very important. How did he view himself? Mary and Joseph say, son, why have you treated this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Who says that? Mary. She's the I. And he said to to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? I want you to really think about those words in red on your Bible there, if you if you have them in red, Jesus's response. I, I want to speak with kindness to our Friends who maybe still worship in the Catholic Church or who have friends and family who do. We all do here in Santa Fe, don't we? It's so crucial that we base our practices on the Word of God, isn't it? Mary was human. She made mistakes. She's not divine. She's not worthy of worship. Mary is imperfect, just like you and me. In fact, she is humanly frustrated with Jesus here. Did you catch that? She's the one speaking and she says, why have you treated us this way? Your father, and that's a really important word here, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. She's the one speaking. And Jesus has to remind her, mom, Joseph is not my dad. And when Jesus says that, he's not saying something cruel. He he is speaking truth, fact. This will be a continual theme in the ministry of Jesus. Who is his father? Literally, virgin birth. His father is God the Father. People will ask him all throughout his ministry. This doesn't happen just once. All throughout his ministry, people will ask him about his earthly family. And what does he always do? He points to his heavenly family. Now, he he will ask John to take care of his mom when he's on the cross. He certainly cares for them. He wants them to know he loves them. He even says here in verse 51, if he would have just come and asked me, I would have would have left. Or he says that in 49. And then in 51, it says he submitted to them and he left, cares about her. But his mission is divine. He is in his father's house. Verse 49, the temple. What happened was Mary and Joseph, his dad who looked over him on earth, but who was not his biological dad, all the relatives, they had finished their ceremonial religious Passover celebration when the number of days was over. They just took off and left. They're done with being spiritual for right now, but not Jesus. A lot of people want to place blame for Jesus being left or they wonder who should be blamed here. Is it Jesus's fault? Is it his parents fault? And I would say we know from the rest of scripture that Jesus is perfect. So that's part of the clue. But also, if you look down in verse 51, when they ask him to go home with them, after all this, it says he continued in subjection to them or your translation may say he submitted to them. 
In other words, if anyone would have come and asked him to leave the first time, he would have obeyed his parents. He would have done what is right. But they left him. Nobody came and asked him. And here's Luke's point. Jesus was doing the most natural thing in the world. To be in his father's house in the center of spirituality in Jerusalem. If you will look at the verb in verse 49, Jesus is saying, why did it take you a whole day to look for me? Didn't you know where I would be? And look at what he says. I must be. I, or yours may say, I had to be in my father's house. Where do you look for keys? On the key hook. Where do you look for your glasses? In the glass case or on your face sometimes, right? Where will the Son of God be? In Father God's house. If this seems harsh to you, if you've struggled with this story in the past and and felt like you didn't really grasp the point of what Luke is saying, Jesus' answer is, Mom, I'm in the most natural place in the world for me, and yet you looked for me for a whole day? If you'd have just asked me to leave, verse 51, I would have left. And yet Luke wants us to know Mary and Joseph still don't get it. If I was raising the Messiah, I'm sure I would have missed it too. I get ordained and leave no in the car. I would have been on a different wavelength. But people forget about the other side of the story that this Jesus for three days had to find a place to sleep, had to find food for himself. Maybe the, the rabbis and priests in the temple took care of him there. But notice how Luke highlights this fact for us. Look down at verse 50. Luke writes it down just to make sure we understand. They didn't understand. What Luke is telling us is that Mary and Joseph are on a completely different wavelength than Jesus is. They are thinking with the flesh. Jesus is in the spirit. Here's the other thing we need to get close to our Messiah and understand how his godly nature, 100% divine, 100% human, his, his divinity always comes first in his priorities. This will be a continual theme, as I was saying, in the ministry of Jesus. His real family is God, and he will point that. As people ask him about his, his uh, family on earth, he will say things like this. This is in Mark three thirty two. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And he answered them and said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God... He is my brother and sister and mother. That stuff happened all the time in the ministry of Christ. And if you want to get to know Christ well, you have to not be um, surprised by those opportunities. When it seems as though he's looking down on his family, he's not. He loves them. He cares for them. We see that in many other passages. What's he doing? He is always on the spiritual wavelength first. He's Christ. This is why He came. It would be weird if my son Noah did that to his mom. He wouldn't because he's scared of her. But it's not weird for Christ. It's not. C.S. Lewis says something in Mere Christianity that I quote once in a while, and I hope you'll remember it. Be able to talk about it with your friends and family, especially those who don't believe. He says this. I'm trying here, this is a mere Christianity, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, this is one thing we must not ever say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him or kill him as a demon or you can call you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. 
But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. Jesus has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. This is one of those times in the life of Christ. He's only at age 12. But if Jesus was not the Son of God, then yeah, sure. What happened here might be a little disrespectful towards mom and dad. But see, he's claiming to be in his father's house. He's claiming to be the son of God. And therefore, it's a completely different story. This is a direct claim to be God. People want to say Jesus was just a great teacher. No, he consistently from the beginning to end of his ministry claimed to be God. And C.S. Lewis helps us to see either he was lying or something worse. Or he was who he says he was. And we have to pick. What do we believe about this man? It's the most important question for you in your life. What do you think about Jesus? Was he telling the truth? Or does the rest of his behavior line up like he was lying or a madman? I would say absolutely not. But we've got to make that decision. Friend, I cannot make it for you. You and I each have to decide if we will worship Jesus as God or if we will think he was something less. Much later, after the cross and resurrection, Jesus' family... By the way, this is one of the apologetic reasons that I believe in Jesus Christ. His family would have been the most natural people in the world. In John 7, it says that in the beginning of his ministry, they doubted him. A lot of his relatives did. But at the end of his ministry... His family fall at his feet and worship him as God. His family saw him grow up. They saw him use the restroom and eat and sleep. They saw him at age 12 and age 16. Remember that time he got left in Jerusalem, they would say to each other? And they were Jewish. These people were the last people on earth who would have worshipped a human being as God unless he was. Jews had this extremely high and separated reverence for God. They wouldn't even pronounce his name. They held God, Yahweh, in such esteem and reverence. The last people on earth to worship a human being were Jewish people. And yet all of his first disciples were Jews who worshipped him as God. Later in his, uh, in his ministry, all, most of his family worshipped Jesus as God. His brother James even leads the church in Jerusalem. They make up their minds about Christ. Have you made up yours? So he amazes the professional rabbis. He's in his father's house. Jesus is 100% God. And finally, Luke shows us also that Jesus at age 12 was 100% man human. Jesus is completely this complete unique combination in the history of the world of God and man. No one ever has been or ever will be like him. In uh, AD 325, so uh, a few centuries after what we're reading about here in Luke, there was a, a, a heretical teacher in Alexandria, Arius. This is in Egypt. And he had been teaching that Jesus was created by God, not co-eternal that he was uh, God's own creation. He hadn't always existed with the Father. He wasn't equal with the Father. And this was a problem because Alexandria had the the world's biggest library at the time. It was uh, a center of learning. People came from all over the Mediterranean to study in Alexandria. And so this is a problem that Arius was teaching, this false teaching, because biblically, Arius was clearly wrong. Many passages talk about Jesus existing before the foundation of the world. They talk about his divinity, like the the passage we're reading here, but also his humanity. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word is monogenes in Greek. Mono, one, and genesis, come from. Jesus and God came from one place, one substance. They are the same. Colossians 2 9 and 1 19. I have them on your hand out there. They say, For in Jesus all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. All the fullness of God dwelt in Christ. It's all over the Bible and it's here at age 12. 
So this group of pastors got together and said, what are we going to do about Arius? He's, uh, this was in Nicaea. It's not too far from where Ephesus is in Turkey. And they try and figure out the best answer. And what they did is based on scripture, and they included a lot of scriptures, but they wrote out a statement that puts together a lot of these statements from scripture about the nature of Christ. Listen to what they put down into what's called today the Nicene Creed. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, means they just came from the same place, they both are co-eternal. Through Him all things were made, that's from Colossians chapter 1, from, men, from us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven for us by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and he became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Our, our faith statement in the Baptist faith and message is a long statement on Christ. I won't read it all, but it says in there that Jesus is fully God and fully man. People, you know, come up with all these creative ways of thinking about Jesus, who he was, what he might have looked like. Uh, Norm Evans was a, a former Miami Dolphins lineman. He wrote in his book on God's squad these words. I guarantee you Christ would be the toughest guy who ever played this game. If he were alive today, I would picture a six foot six inch, 260 pound defensive tackle who would always make the big plays and would be hard to keep out of the backfield for offensive linemen like myself. Fritz Peterson was a, a former New York Yankee. Uh, he fancies Jesus in a baseball uniform. He said this, I firmly believe that as Jesus Christ was sliding into second base, he would knock the second baseman into left field to break up the double play. Christ might not throw a spitball, but he would play hard within the rules. Some picture Jesus with black skin and black hair. Others picture Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. See, we want to make Jesus into our image, don't we? That's what all of those examples were doing. But what Luke is saying is Jesus is the sole, unique individual in the history of the world that's fully God and fully man. Truth is, he was from the Middle East. Probably had skin and hair color to match people groups from that region. You need to think about that as we picture him. But what's so amazing about Jesus, we think about Christmas time, and remember this passage just follows those Christmas passages. That from the, the foundation of the world, Jesus had existed in his godly nature. But at Christmas time, the Bible says, at the fullness of time, Jesus, for the first time, put on flesh and became a man. Pastors call that his earth suit. Kind of like that. He went through human experiences, not all of them. He never married. He never sinned. But Luke is showing us that he had a boyhood. In fact, it's one of the keys that he wants us to get from this story. He was a normal boyhood. When an author really wants you to know something, that one of their tools is to repeat it. We'll look up at verse 40. Chapter 240, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and the grace which was upon him. And then skip all the way down to verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. See him book in this story with that phrase. This is the time of Jesus' growth. He went through a normal human growth process. Kids, students, teenagers who led us today, you can trust in Christ. Because he knows what it means to grow up. Notice here, his parents were mad at him and they were wrong. Jesus does submit to his parents, verse 51. But he knows what it means to have parents rag on you a little too hard and them be in the wrong. Here's the point, because Jesus was fully God and fully human, he knows the human experience perfectly and yet he lived it as God and so we can Trust in Him. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in all things as we are and was yet 
without sin. Keys Kiesler teaches a class on spiritual formation. He recently, recently asked his uh, class of, of college students to close their eyes and picture God. After a few moments, he said, open your eyes and I want you to tell me what you see when you close your eyes. And most of them said they pictured an old man with a white beard floating in the clouds looking down upon us. And Keith said back to them, if you imagine God to be like anything other than Jesus, then you have the wrong idea of God. That's right, biblically. In Jesus, all the fullness of God dwells bodily. Colossians 2.9. Hebrews 1.3. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1.3. Point of our sermon this morning is Luke is showing us about the nature of Christ, God incarnate, at age 12. Showing us that Jesus, still like he was at a baby, as a baby, fully God, fully man, just like he is at age 30, fully God, fully man, he's that same way all the way through. But Jesus' parents are just people. Good people, but just people. This means if you expect any person in your life to be perfect, besides Christ, your parents, your spouse, your children, or even yourself. None of them can bear that weight. You're believing a lie. You need to expect the people in your life, including yourself, to be human. Yes, expect them to do what is right. Encourage one another towards what is righteous. Sometimes wrongs, abuse, and the like, they have to have serious consequences. But the Bible always calls us to love and forgive each other because that is the way of Christ. Be encouraged, parents, because Jesus' parents weren't perfect and he turned out pretty great. In fact, second, only Jesus has lived this life perfectly. Turned out really great. Everything about him is different. Trust him, therefore. He can bear the weight of perfect expectations. He wants to. Bring your burdens to him. Look to him to fulfill the longings in your heart that feel unfulfilled. He is able. Whereas the people in your life can't always do that. Say to him, here is my life. Lord, here are my hopes and dreams. I trust them into your hands. And when I don't get something I want, I'm going to trust you until that day comes. Trust him with your bad days too, finally. Because he knows what it's like to be a human. When you think that you could never forgive that person who did that thing to you, go to Christ and find the power you need to do it. He hung on a cross as an innocent man and said about you and me, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That's our God. Let's pray. God, one of the most important things about each one of us is how we view you. As Luke shows us the nature of our Lord at age 12. And we wrestle with some of the parts of this story. Do we wrestle with them because we miss how natural it was for your son to be in your house? Do we miss parts of the story because we don't see how frustrated Mary gets? Because she's human. Lord, let the parents in the room be encouraged. God, let every one of us see that your son can be trusted. And let each of us see that he can be trusted on our worst days. Because he was human and he knew what it meant to live a rough human life. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for being our God. I'm going to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed as we enter our time of reflection. I want to ask you if you have the right conception of Jesus Christ in your mind or if God is just 
somebody floating in the clouds with a big beard. First of all, I want you to know you are not God. You don't have to have unrealistic expectations of yourself to be perfect. Maybe you had imperfect parents and that's one of the things they taught you to do. That you had to be perfect. Could you lay down some of those expectations you have of people today? Maybe yourself. Could you lay them down at the cross and have a biblical conception of yourself? Second, maybe have you not yet come to believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? Do that right now. He is worthy. Trust Him with your life. The way to become a Christian is to trust Him. We say ABC, admit your sin to God, believe on Christ to save you, trust Him, and confess Him as your Lord. Repent and follow Him. If you're not a Christian yet, trust in Christ today. And third, maybe you've forgotten that Jesus is the one who can bear all your burdens. He can sympathize with problems with this world and weaknesses. He was tempted in every way, the Bible says. Bring your burdens to Him. Lay them down. Number them with Him. He cares for you. In whatever way you need to respond to God, do that now as our band leads us.
Thank you, Randy and the youth band team. Isn't that good reminder? Lord, we need you. And he delights in giving himself to us. Church family, let's look at the bulletin and see what's coming up in the life of our church. Next Sunday, August 14th, there's a deacons meeting right after church in the COC. The Santa Fe Christian School first day of classes begins on Wednesday, August 17th. And everyone's getting sad if you go back to school. Also excited, maybe you're excited to go back to school, I don't know. Uh, if you're looking or know someone who's in elementary and is, uh, has kids and is interested in Christian education, uh, they're still taking applications for the new year. Check out their website. Um, our fall kickoff is will be on Sunday, September the 11th. Um, kids and youth connection groups uh, will begin on Sunday mornings. Uh, we'll have sen- uh, connection groups. That's our Sunday school uh, for everyone in the family. And we would want to invite you, invite everyone to be a part of one. Uh, the women's ministry hosted a, a women's breakfast and a, a fellowship time, a service project yesterday. I heard, I didn't go, but I heard it was a great time of fellowship and prayer. So thank you, Charlotte, and everyone who helped on that. Uh, they're inviting all ladies, 18 and older, to a women's retreat at Glorietta, September 30th through October 1st. Um, space is limited. You can register online. There's an FAQ uh, with more details on their church's website. Um, that's all that's coming up this week. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Skip Hipperly, uh chairman of the deacons, for a special recognition of, of Pastor Reed and Amy and his sweet family as they celebrate five years of ministry at FBC. Thank you, Brother Chris, Pastor Reed, Amy, Henry, Noah, for coming to uh, join us on the stage here for just a few minutes. Got my big brother back up here on stage with me. So ladies, if you want to go ahead and sit. Gentlemen, if you want to stand behind them. First family, uh, we greet you in the name of our Heavenly Father on this special day of recognition and take this precious moment to thank our Lord and Savior for allowing us to share His love together. Today we graciously celebrate Pastor Reed and his dear family to recognize his fifth year anniversary at First Baptist Church of Santa Fe, this year commemorating 105 years of this old church on the Old Pecos Trail. <laughs> Pastor Reed, read us with appreciation for your ministry what we pray for you, guidance, for the paths your feet will daily follow, wisdom for the counsel you are asked to give, compassion for those you are called upon to help. What we wish for you, strength, to stand for what is true and right even when there is opposition, courage to press on even when things seem routine, perseverance to follow the desires God has placed in your heart even when you doubt. What we give you, support, for your leadership, appreciation for your calling and gifts. Thank you for the person you are in Christ. God bless you, and we love you, Pastor Reed, First Baptist Church, Faith Family, Santa Fe, New Mexico, five-year anniversary, August 2022. Okay, Skip's got the mic, so go ahead and sit down. I got a few more things to say. <laughs> Pastor Reed, the apostle you are, a man who teaches the word of God, the word of truth that gives people power, the power to love, the love of God. A man who not only hugs the sheep, but touches the heart of his flock. A man whose encouragement brings light into dark places and pierces the heart into conviction. A man whose smile actually means, I love you. A man whose eye says, I'm praying for you. A man whose lessons from the pulpit motivate you to jump up and say, I can do that, bring it on. A man we appreciate and love, and who we are all proud to call our own. Amy, 
The wife of a pastor is no ordinary role. It is not for the jealous or timid soul. So we take this moment without further ado to say, Co-Pastor, we celebrate you. Though demands are never ending and recognitions few, your smiles are ever present, never stale, each one new. You're an example to the sister, an encourager to the brother, while obeying Christ's command that we serve one another. You are gloriously appreciated as an enhancer of life. You're not a queen, you're a pastor's wife. Yeah. Pastors, we, we are so blessed that God sent you to this place to lead the way and teach us from his word. We thank you for your ministry, your guidance, your care, and ask God to grant his greatest blessings on your life is our humble and constant prayer. Amy, we thank God for our pastor. We definitely give him thanks for you too, for when God blessed us with your husband, he also sent us you. And we say thank you for all you do and lift up in prayer. Your presence blesses all of us, our pastor's wife. You are serving God in a fine and worthy way. Noah and Emery, you two have grown up too quickly before our eyes. Your servant hearts are so appreciated as you serve in worship, vacation Bible school, the nursery, worship projection, the priest team, and your leadership each Sunday and at youth camp. First family in recognition of Pastor Reed, Amy, Noah, Emery, for their dedication of five years of dedicated service. We, First Baptist Church of Santa Fe, sincerely appreciate your devotion, your love, your spirit, your teachings from the Bible, and your godly wisdom. You are a blessing and a light on the hill to our first family. We continually remember before our God and Heavenly Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, and hopefully your PhD through hard work at George W. Truett Theology Seminary at Baylor University. Thank you for five memorable years. We love you. And at this time, Sherry Price, if you'll come forward, please. great pleasure to be here today back in this church 45 years ago my husband and I were called as your uh, pastor and pastor's wife and family um, because this was one of our very favorite churches to serve in and because we raised our kids in this church like this special family did um, we had a painting commissioned uh, with the help of Judy Wade uh, to for us because we just wanted that picture in our home all these years. Um, so I felt led today to give this picture to the Rita's family. Um, so Skip, if you'll help here. Amy and Noah and Emery, I couldn't be more proud of y'all <laughs> for your commitment and your uh, dedication to embrace this church. It's such a missional opportunity, and I knew they had a missional heart when I uh, felt led to recommend them here to this church, and boy, have they ever gone with that and proven that in mighty ways. So it gives me great pleasure to give you this. I'm so, uh, so proud of you. Um, I, um, the church is not, uh, the, the picture of the church, the building, is not the church. It's simply uh, a, a building. But this church has such a great legacy of being a lighthouse on the hill and uh, for showing Christ's love in this community. So I would hope that this church would be a reminder to you all of that. Um, 
I uh, wanted to close with the, one of my favorite scriptures because I know God still has great things uh, for this church for the future and the legacy that it's going to leave. So I'd like to close with Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May God richly bless your family and your family your ministry um, as he uses y'all in mighty ways. Thank you so much. They're like my kids. Sharing him with us, knowing.